everyone, it's Alex, and today I'm here to give my top 10 reads of 2022. I read 54 books this year, so as expected too. I don't know what it is, but anytime I read books in December, they turn out to be some of the best books I've read for the year, or they become like a dark horse to my whole reading year. But before I do talk about the books I read, I do want to talk about my last video about leaving booktube, and if you don't care about that stuff, I'll put a timestamp right here. That way you can skip all this stuff and just go to the rankings of the books I read. And with that last video, a lot of people said really nice things that was kind of overwhelming, um, but in some ways I just wanted to clarify exactly about why I'm leaving booktube because I didn't really explain it. And people were wondering where they can find me elsewhere, so I am on Goodreads and Instagram, so all of that's linked on my about page in case you're wondering. And to be honest, there's not really a reason as to why I'm leaving, it's just really Again, thinking of how many books I've read in my life, it's probably close to 600, or at least according to Goodreads. So I don't know. I just feel like me being in my late 20s, that's like a bunch of books that I've read. So really, I feel like in a way, not doing booktube, even though there's maybe not an exact correlation, will cause me to read a lot more slowly, which is what I prefer. But even me reading, quote unquote, a lot, like 54 books for a year, which is a lot, uh, especially to, you know, people that don't know about booktube or maybe don't read as frequently as a hobby. Booktube has never made me feel like I have to read more, so that's not what I'm saying at all. If anything, the benefit of booktube to me has been the benefit of articulating myself and me really loving giving a presentation about a book, whether through a book review or just talking about it like in a wrap-up or something. So that's what I've enjoyed the most, this sense of maybe quote-unquote critical thinking that reading has allowed me, which some people might say is <laughs> fun. And to be honest, since having made that video back in October, I think it has given me some distance about me thinking more about booktube, and I may even say that perhaps I was a little too premature about how I describe leaving booktube exactly. Because like I said with this past month, or I guess this current month being December, I have read a lot of great stuff and it made me the most excited I've been possibly with me consuming books that I've been reading all year in some ways. And that initial reaction didn't like make me think that I wanted to post my thoughts on booktube completely, but it did make me realize that I did want to think about what I read a lot this month, but then I realized I had nowhere to really <laughs> do that other than the space of booktube. Um, I could do it somewhere like Instagram or something, but for those of you that follow me on there, I'm not like a complete book person on there. Uh, I like it's much more like my personal life and it just so happens to be about books sometimes. So I think now revising my ideas about booktube, tentatively speaking, I think I'll do this. I plan to do hopefully two videos a year and that's it. So maybe like in June a mid-year reading check-in and then of course the end of year December top reads kind of video. And that's a big if on the mid-year one because to be honest I I really don't know how much I will plan to read in 2023. Maybe only like literally a handful of books, like four or five maybe, but definitely one series that I'll end up talking about later in this video. So yeah, that's like a revision to my whole leaving booktube thing, which in a way I kind of feel like I am lying to people based on that, but I mean, you know, people will be lied to in different scenarios and your life so you know this is only another life lesson for you I guess. So yeah maybe a max of two videos a year that's pretty much it. Uh, again two being a big if with that mid-year one. So I guess technically you could say I still am leaving booktube so I like there's no real content creator vibe from me in a sense of that where you know I can't really imagine people staying subscribed to me if I only plan to upload potentially twice a year, so it doesn't feel as organic to really say I'm still a part of booktube in that sense. But what I've always loved about booktube, which I've said a lot, is that booktube is super low stakes. So, you know, me just checking in every couple of times a year, that sounds great to me and hopefully to you too. And I really can't emphasize enough that if you've always thought about starting a booktube channel, you really don't need to do anything. You literally just need to turn on your phone like what I'm doing and just talk about whatever you're reading or what you want to read or whatever else. Uh, that's really it. So uh, that's the plan going forward kind of with this channel. So I'm sorry again if I feel like I duped you, uh, 
But hopefully you consider this good news. It's good news to me, so I'm glad I'm not giving this up com completely. Uh, but yeah, we'll see. Hopefully June, something. Uh, but definitely, if you don't see me by then, you'll definitely see me at the end of next year for my not even top reads, because who knows if I'll have read enough to have a top reads, but at least like a reading wrap up for the year and my general thoughts next year. So yeah, that's it on that. But now moving on to the top 10 reads of the year. So I feel like I rambled there a lot in the beginning. So I'm going to do like this a lot for the number 10. So if you're like screen grabbing and trying to find where it all starts, it's starting here. So coming in at number 10, I have An Exciting and Vivid Inner Life by Paul Dallarosa. This is a short story collection that to me does a really great job at hosting a lot of characters that have this great theme regarding ambition. A lot of these characters have very unique goals that they're trying to mentally assess whether or not is within their grasp. Usually at the capacity of some unique restrictions that are usually related to their job or what their job can afford them to do with their own resources. It gives the tone of the stories this practicality which is kind of refreshing because I feel like so many literary fiction stories or even long form fiction I read has this sort of romanticized sense to it, but this collection kind of really squashes that, and I really like that. Instead of characters imagining their desires, I feel like these characters really take action and initiative, even if in doing so in maybe some unethical ways that really pave the way for the characters to think about their own moral rearing. Or at least what I liked, I feel like it was uncovering a lot of instinctive, selfish qualities and trying to really carve out where those feelings are coming from, making the characters turn back on themselves and wonder if they really know who they think they are. So yeah, really good collection, I think really solid, and I'm really excited for Paul Della Rosa's next project. Coming in at number nine, we have Dogs of Summer by Andrea Abreu, translated from the Spanish by Julia Sanchez. This novel follows two girls living their childhood in the Canary Islands, and immediately upon reading this book you'll know that it's very grotesque. The first page talking about young girls throwing up and it doesn't stop there. I really think it speaks to how well Abru does at what I think is a defining characteristic of childhood being this idea, especially in a pair or a unit of these two girls, how they mimic each other and the sense of mimicry is trying to find this model of what can be anticipated adolescence or adulthood. And even between these two girls, I think they're really great at being characterized. I feel like they were really like specific and interesting. And as these two girls describe in the periphery, these other people that live in their neighborhood, it's really a matter of these other kids too developing their own sense of mimicry that I talk about, whether playing with Barbies and wondering if unfortunately you'll be abused, or undermining the professionalism of a teacher trying to get you off a sexual chat room. This book is just really engaging on behalf of our narrator. Now she has conflict with possessing her own independence while in contrast to her best friend. And props to this book too because often with child characters I lose interest pretty quickly, but I feel like they were written with a lot of maturity and a lot of skill. Because I feel like, at least for me, like you know, when you're a child, that's the oldest you are, so you think you already know everything, and I feel like that's kind of the tone of what these two girls have, and I really like this book. I think it was like really quippy and quick and interesting and has a lot to say, so I really liked it, and I hope people uh, pick it up in the new year. Coming in at number eight, I have Sula by Toni Morrison, similarly being another book about friendship between two girls. And I've read The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison before, so I understood the writing style I was getting into, and Morrison continues to be on a league of her own to me, so I can't wait to go through more of her backlist in the new year. There's just something about how she writes with so much confidence that I would literally believe anything she writes about. In this case, Sula being about those two friends I mentioned being Sula and Nell. Their friendship comes to a head whenever a certain event happens that really imprints on their memory and kind of haunts them. But even beyond that, I think Morrison is a master at really knowing how to mythologize the whole environment in which a character inhabits. No less creating a setting that lasts between the 1920s and 1940s, I think Morrison is so consistent at completely fleshing out this whole world, even if it is fiction, which I think is a goal often. I think books kind of forget because I feel like books to me that I'm reading are so character driven that they kind of lose that sense of 
the world in a sense for the lack of a better term. I think Morrison paints that so well because even beyond Sula and Nell in this book there are other characters that have these very visceral reactions to certain events in this town or community that really creates the narrative again of this word I've been using, this mythology. And even amidst all that there's so much tragedy which is so meticulously described and it's horrible and really like stays with you in your memory. And how incredible it is that Morrison is able to make Sula and Nell these two characters and two women that really understand as they're aging how their upbringing really influences and more importantly gives them enough time to formulate their own opinions causing Sula and Nell to actually go in different trajectories in their life. And between the both of them one trajectory isn't better than the other but the whole ride and experience is the best part. So yeah, I really love this and I am excited to read more of Morrison in the future, definitely. Coming in at number seven is actually one of those December reads that I mentioned and it's Three Rooms by Joe Hamya. And this is a real return to form to me and by that I mean reading a book about a sad 20-something. <laughs> in Three Rooms we follow this woman who I believe is unnamed as she's beginning to be a graduate student, so it sounds perfectly aimless. Now our narrator is really inspired and really enriched by thinking about A Room of One's Own by Virginia Woolf, which is a green flag for me. And in some ways the novel is a direct parallel to A Room of One's Own, but just like to me I would best describe it as a modern, not retelling, but I feel like the sentiments of like wanting to understand how the restrictions of one's life really make them capable for the resources they have, no less being about a woman of color. And the whole novel is spent as the narrator thinks of these medleys of binaries and how she's always trying to reinvent or really overall discover who she is trying to fit into all those things. An example being that she thinks about being educated versus overeducated, living in a city or not in the city, living alone versus living with a roommate, and even using dating apps or trying to meet someone in person. But what's great about all these things other than it trying to be this modern sensibility of a room of one's own is that I think the narrator is self-aware enough to escape her own sense of doom with trying to overthink about stuff. Very cheekily Joe Hamya fits in here a section where our narrator actually also loves reading about sad 20-something women, kind of creating a contrast to how much more it's assumed that our narrator is trying to break out of this cyclical nature of maybe even like pessimism or like being a victim to society, which she finds really hard to do because she's so distracted by the real things she has to do, like have a job or again that comparison I mentioned, living alone or having a roommate, all seeming to go back to that capitalism equals bad. But even me saying that isn't completely simplifying the thought process because to me I think this novel overall is thinking back on maybe especially my early 20s and thinking that things maybe weren't as bad as I had assumed. But is that because I wouldn't have known how much harder things would be in my mid to late 20s? But Jo Hamia, her purpose with this book isn't to try to like be nihilistic or have this sense of existentialism. The thought process behind our narrator feels really organic to me and thought-provoking, but you have to remember again she's a graduate student in the liberal arts so there is some room for pretension within like the prose and the writing style just a little bit. Again in a self-aware way, so I really liked this. It was very thought-provoking again, I've used that word but I just really liked this and I liked the vibe and the voice and any references to Virginia Woolf I'll always eat up. Coming at number six with a non-fiction appearance is Ola Poppy by John Paul Brammer. This is an essay collection about Brammer's time being a gay advice columnist. I'm really surprised actually that whenever I was making this list that this book came up so high or on this list at all because when I was first reading the essays in here they did come off as really twee and entertaining and on that commercial side to me. But I was slowly realizing as I was reading these essays in order that it also caused Brammer to also open up and become more vulnerable with inserting his own philosophies about being a gay man of color within his own advice. But what I really love is that Brammer is always focused on his audience or the patron that's like tuning in trying to get some advice so there's certainly still this sense of professionalism about it that I really appreciate it. Because John Paul Brammer is also really funny. I think he has a great personality and even me just reading this like 
words on pages, I could totally tell that he had so much charm. And I just, again, really love how he was so relatable without making his advice about him, even if he was citing some anecdotes for these patrons to relate to. But the cherry on top is that anytime that Brammer was giving advice from his own life, they of course often were also about other gay men. And in doing so, he was also really respecting these gay men that he was telling stories about, really understanding their own awakening with their sexuality, even if it was kind of bad news for Brammer within the story's outcomes. So this synthesis of taking from his own real life and again, thinking of his audience being a person wanting this advice, I think was really well done and perfectly executed. So it can be both. It can be the twee entertaining stuff that I did enjoy in the beginning, but later on, I think it does dive deeper and we get to know Brammer more. So I really liked this and it was a great, like refreshing, happy reading experience, which is very rare for me because I'm reading all these like sad, uh, serious, quote unquote, stories. So yeah, I really recommend this, especially for anyone looking for a quick non-fic book. Okay, we're getting into the big leagues here at number five. So the second half of my top reads, and that is Paradise by Fernanda Melchor, translated from the Spanish by Sophie Hughes. Much like Dogs of Summer, this novel follows two friends, but I use the word friends lightly. This time, instead of two girls, it's about two boys, also in their adolescence, and they're also similarly very grotesque. Their names are Polo and Franco, and actually Polo works for Franco and his family. So immediately there are these chess pieces that Melchor is concocting in which it's very much about this sense of class divide with this novel, especially beating you over the head with themes of masculinity, which I found the most interesting. Whether or not masculinity is this innate quality or is something socially constructed. As both Polo and Franco, even if they have clear differences and Polo definitely doesn't like Franco. They do share their own sense of masculinity with their immediate use of shared language, again being super gross and uh, misogynistic. But that similarly doesn't necessarily gauge or correlate to how they have the same ethics and values, especially with some crazy stuff that happens later in the book, which leads me to say that this book is completely compelling. I couldn't stop reading it, and I think I only read this in like, uh, one and a half sittings, but the book isn't very long either, but it's completely bingeable. And I just love Melchor's writing style. She's so immersive and really talented. And I have hurricane season by her as well that I hope to read in the new year. She just has a way of completely commanding her characters and really understanding how they interact and how they'd react to each other. It's really mesmerizing. And I really think she's one to watch. I think she'll have a great array of work within like the next 10 years. Coming in at number four is again one of those books I read this month and it is My Struggle Book One by Carl of Knosgaard, translated from the Norwegian by Don Bartlett. You must be living under a rock if you haven't heard of this living autobiography about this guy. I know this is only book one but that alone is like a little over 400 pages and I think I've heard that the whole series is like 3,000 pages long so I have a lot more to go. But that being said, Carl of Knosgaard, at least to my knowledge, the premise of this series isn't that he's really like done anything, which, you know, is a little strange to call a book series my struggle. But you can imagine with the length of this series being that a lot of it is probably just, you know, this whole sense of his life. So book one, as expected, was largely about his childhood and then in the later half about a unique event about his father. And the thread through all of it is that Kanansgar does mention that he wants to be a writer, so he is sort of combating with those feelings and trying to work those things out. Even as we're introduced to the book in the first place from Kanansgar being an adult, again thinking about his dad, there's some like dad issues in this book, so maybe that's why I like it. So we already were given the secret of knowing that Kanansgar is already reflecting on his childhood and adolescence, so it's like a present to past kind of ish back to present again. So what is it about this series that puts it so high on my list? And for me, I think it's just that Knozgard is a writer that really understands his reader. I read this book purely under its own categorization of being treated as fiction, although it's very much well aware that Knozgard is just, you know, writing nonfiction. Even with inserting himself being about Knozgard, like Carl Ove himself, novelized into this book and for the whole rest of the series, I think what did it for me is that I just couldn't escape the spell of 
Knozgaard's hypnotizing way of just describing these very specific small moments of his life that he really cherishes. He's been heralded as the Norwegian Proust, so in some ways, because I did read In Search of Lost Time, and for that I didn't have as much of a well-received reaction. I think the reason I like the My Struggle book one, at least for now, is that Knozgaard doesn't waste time. Very much early on in the beginning he does mention about he's even unaware or questioning how he specifically loves his children. And he's not crazy, he doesn't like, you know, hate his kids or whatever, but he does talk about these different senses of love and how he's aware of them and he's trying to articulate them, which is why we go back into the past as he thinks about his youth and in particular about his father. In some ways it's even really investigative as it feels like Kanazgard is researching his own life, trying to unearth the past, trying to understand these fleeting moments of wistfulness that he had in his youth and why it lingers into his adulthood. Whether being a tryhard writer that he feels like he was in school or being a part of a band or having failed crushes in his youth. And believe me, the last thing I want to read about is straight people having sex with each other. But Knozgaard really knows how to write a sentence and makes me so compelled to always keep reading. I think I whizzed through this book in like a day and a half and again it's a little over 400 pages and uh, the margins are not generous. I don't know, I can't really explain it but it just feels like a book that's really ambitious and in its own way true to life I say is like a late 20 something. So I get the hype and I can't wait to read the rest of the series next year, which I plan to do, which is why earlier I mentioned the whole like possible mid-year check-in. I'm kind of worried if I do that it's just going to be me talking about the rest of the series the whole time. If there's any point of reference that I can give about what my struggle reminds me of that I've read, which is probably why I really liked it, is it reminds me a lot of The Liar's Club by Mary Carr, which is one of my favorite books. and probably my favorite nonfiction book. So if you've read that or if you've read Mary Carr, I would highly recommend also picking up Kanazgar. Okay, so I need to preface number three being that I am unwell. So Taking the Bronze is Simple Passion by Annie Erno, translated from the French by Tanya Leslie. I first read The Years by Annie Erno, and it was my first book I read by her a few years ago. And it was this beautiful synthesis of personal memory and history. And I think it was so wonderfully done and so professional and wonderful and I think a book that a lot of people would really enjoy. It was so vivid about life and it felt like Erno had this secret ability to step back in time at any duration that she wanted and she could fully realize her memories and really transport a reader there. So then I read Getting Lost by Annie Erno earlier this year which is just like a diary that she kept but I learned that through the diaries from getting lost. Her whole experience with that is what inspired Simple Passion. And the reason I say I'm unwell is because I relate in some ways to Erno's feelings that she describes in Getting Lost and also Simple Passion. Best summarized that I think Annie Erno is the most down bad person I've never met in my life. So to recap, again, Erno, I think, being this master of memory. I totally get why, because she had this crush on this guy and she had an affair, so that's why she kept the diaries that are entailed in getting lost. And with Simple Passion, it's just this quote-unquote fictionalized version of that experience. And this guy treats her so bad and I loved it. So the reason Simple Passion is so high on my list is on one hand, I think it's a really very well-written dedication and homage again to memory, which Erno is a master of. Sometimes when I read writers, I always think, especially writers as regarded as Erno and how people love the years and love her whole work, but I always forget all the time that writers are real people with real lives and interests and desires. So reading Getting Lost and Simple Passion, as intimate as they are and very raw and vulnerable, and you know, there's some things that Erno says in Simple Passion that I you know, I don't know if it was the times or what, but she says some very strange stuff about, you know, gay people and AIDS, but I'm overlooking that. But she's so genuine and she, I just really believe that she needs and loves writing, which is a feeling, to be honest, I feel like I should always get from a writer I read, even beyond nonfiction. I feel like I should just tell that from their work with the dedication to fiction they have if I'm reading a novel. Which I know is a really unrealistic pedestal to put a writer on because 
they don't have to share vulnerable things to me in order for me to like them. I can totally understand that separation of privacy, which Erno definitely does not have. But even with how sparse and brief that simple passion is, I think that really does reflect the yearning and pining of a past romantic experience. As Erno tries to formulate and literally create this fictionalized sense of a conclusion and a goodbye to an experience that didn't feel completely resolved. And how much upon reflection that can teach you about yourself, or in Erno's case, her having some life lessons of her own, especially in this quote that I wanted to read to you. Erno states, I discovered what people are capable of. In other words, anything, sublime or deadly desires, lack of dignity, attitudes and beliefs I had found absurd in others until I myself turned to them. Without knowing it, he brought me closer to the world. Even beyond the romantic implications of this relationship that Erno had, I think it can really extend to any philosophy about choosing to maintain a relationship, even platonic ones. And aren't relationships something we should always be turning over in our head, like repeatedly, just understanding why we cherish them or why we choose to voluntarily partake in them? I don't know, maybe I'm just being a little too woo-woo with my reading experience of this, but I really loved it. And I, as always, really love Annie Erno. So I'm excited to read, probably, realistically, the rest of her backlog in 2023. And now taking the silver, which might be a shock to many, is Either Or by Elif Botman. I know a lot of you are doing some finger wagging and you probably thought this would be my number one read, but it was pretty darn close. As what probably doesn't surprise many of you if you've been watching me for a while, is that I often cite that my favorite novel is The Idiot by Elif Botman, as Either Or is actually a sequel to The Idiot. In Either Or, we follow our narrator again, Celine, as she is partaking in her sophomore year at Harvard. We last left Celine literally at the end of her freshman year, where she iconically states that she feels she hadn't learned a thing at all. Which made me happy to finish either or, and I feel like Celine has learned a lot now. And I know between the discussions of Idiot and either or, a lot of people either love it or hate it. I'm definitely in the love it category, mainly because I know a lot of people have trouble with it being described as a novel or novels about nothing, which I would say is entirely true. Our initial gateway into understanding Selene Moore is that she is someone that, generally speaking, has a hang-up about this crush that she had on a classmate. While simple in nature with a premise like that, I feel like what really sells the idiot and either or for me this time being the interactions that Selene has with her fellow classmates and other characters. And for me, claiming that Botman especially is a master at dialogue, whether or not positioning intellectual debates in which people really want to talk to each other through this dialogue, or more commonly maybe where it's just people trying to wait to say things that they want to say that they've had planned for the whole time. It's all really endearing to me, and I think that's just part of the fun, even though I can admit that The Idiot and Either Or, especially more so in Either Or, is a novel that lacks some sort of sense of stakes in its own way. It's definitely within Botman's mind that those who are reading the Either Or probably liked The Idiot and are just continuing the story. For me, what keeps me as a committed reader of Selene's life is just how much Selene is always constantly rediscovering herself, whether in The Idiot discovering a love of Russian literature, and now in Either Or discovering a love of the literal book Either Or. It's this sense of wonder and exploration of a character organically feeling like they're getting to know themselves that I feel like is often missing in contemporary literature. I often feel with fiction I read, I can always sense that the character I read about is trying to cut to the chase and immediately get to where they want to be. But Selene is someone that always ponders about things and always changes her mind and always tries to resist being haunted by email exchanges with a crush. But I totally get the kind of impatience that people can have with a book like Either Or, maybe even more so than The Idiot, even though that I think Either Or is more readable. Maybe it's a mirror to how I described Annie Erno and Simple Passion that I just really like feeling like I get to know the writer through their work that I feel like is what's happening to me with Elif Botman and Either Or. But if you want more convincing about this book, I highly recommend, or in fact encourage, that you go watch Claire's book review of this because I think it's so good and so well thought out. Claire and I both love The Idiot and Elif Botman, and one of these days I'm gonna get her a 
Zazzle DIY dupe version of the Either Or sweatshirt. But before you go off and watch Claire's review of Either Or, you can also watch mine for my full thoughts and why I love the book. In fact, I'd probably recommend you watch mine first and then Claire's after. That way I'm not too embarrassed about <laughs> me finding Claire's so much better. And I just really love that review. I've watched it like probably three or four times. I think it's just so well done as is a common characteristic with Claire's videos. And finally, at number one, we have All Down Darkness Wide by Sean Hewitt, which is actually a nonfiction book. So it's taken first place for me this year over fiction. If you couldn't tell from probably I'd say my top four books, I've had a really great reading experience this year with really feeling like I'm getting this sense of a quote unquote pure emotion from the books I'm reading that end up being my favorites. Typically, it's a relationship with the author, so it's probably no surprise that I picked a memoir as my top read. In this memoir, Sean Hewitt recounts his own relationship with his sexuality and also his relationships with other men. And the book is also about how to honor all versions of himself in relation to the outcomes of these relationships with men too, while also taking inventory of his own personal interests, like his love of poetry too. And I think for me, this book really made me, again, similar to Knozgaard, think about how we use that word love in relation to it being characterized to mean different things, especially when we recount how sometimes our demonstrations of love are sometimes our biggest outcomes of our sense of failure. Again, mostly in the context of me noticing how Hewitt writes about relationships, I think it's something really haunting and something that really stayed with me and I found really thought provoking. As Hewitt himself expresses feelings of his own, guilt and shame again with a part of this book being about discovering his own sexuality too and how he does so constantly having us ask oneself whether or not we really ever have a time where we get to stop knowing ourselves and sprinkled in there also thematically and symbolically i think this memoir has really great gestures toward that all tied together because i think this book is one of the most well-written books i've ever read i'm not really one that cares about the prose of a book really affecting my reading experience but here, without a doubt, it's all written so elegantly and effortlessly. And through Hewitt's own references of joy and pain, there's also this immense sense of gratitude with the people he's met and the people he loves and how he cherishes them and describes them too. It's a book that's really hypnotizing to read. I think it has this really effortless rhythm to it that kind of lulls you along into wanting to keep reading and just always wanting to feel captured by these sneaking suspicions of feelings that he was describing without being so literal. Which is somewhat strange to say because I feel like in some ways there is this emotional capacity to what Hewitt is writing about because in some ways I feel like he himself feels reserved in some instances whenever attempting to describe so beautifully his own thoughts about other people or his environment in general. A large part of this memoir is actually Hewitt describing his partner and their depression. It's a thin line that's hard to really, I imagine, writing about and contextualizing what are these quote-unquote right emotions in which to describe someone going through something like depression. Wondering how living alongside someone's experience like that within its own observation is its own experience. I don't know, does that make sense? It's often with memoir that I feel like the memoirist has to be confident about what they know or what they remember. But this memoir made me realize how much easier it is to acknowledge and have that sense of discovery of admitting how much we don't know, whether especially about someone else that isn't our direct experience. This is a memoir that always made me constantly curious whether or not about Hewitt and his own sexuality or in ways how he describes other people it was just completely consuming and I thought about this book for a really long time and it was one of those books on rare occasions, which is very rare that I have, if any, where I just constantly wanted to get back to any instance I could to go read more of this book, like if I was at work or something. It's a book that made me wonder how is it that we can constantly assert our lives and especially in regard to how it always evolves whether about ourself or the people that we choose to keep alongside with us. And more so than any book that I've mentioned in this list, I think that's why it deserves this top spot. I think just really making me think about a lot. And it's a book I really love and I hope more people read in the new year. All right, and that does it for my 
top 10 reads of 2022. I feel like I'm catching this all pretty early, so I feel like now I can relax and watch everyone else's top reads eventually of the year, which I'm really looking forward to. And again, like I said earlier in this video, even though I am revising slightly what it means to quote unquote leave booktube, um, again, I really appreciated all those thoughts that I received on my last video. I, It was, uh, you know, a lot to really take in just like how grateful I feel of this platform. Last but not least, happy reading and happy holidays. And I hope everyone has a great reading start in the new year. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.